565 is on the road here at Open Text World 2025. We're in Nashville. We're talking about our favorite subject over the last two and a half years, and that is AI, Daniel. Yeah, it's been 40 years for me. It's been it's been the most exciting thing since. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, it's been a spelt like, you know, in some days it's felt like the last few years have gone incredibly fast. And at other times, bad, it feels like, um, you know, we just we we're going to slow it down and there's so much happening. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it was a great day today. You know, I have been so focused on the opportunity in AI that sits beyond just the LLMs. And when you come to events like this at, at Open Text World, you hear a company that's really not talking about that at all. Sure, there are models that are required to be the underpinnings for agents to do certain tasks. But in the end, the idea that most of the world's data has not been unearthed to AI yet, that enterprises have all this proprietary value to unlock, and that companies have a real challenge to figure that out, that's exciting. And that, that is really the upside in this AI narrative. Yeah, and that is the big unlock for enterprises. And I like the way that Open Text characterized it. I think they called it the the uh, in-context AI or the contextual uh, AI. And I can't imagine a better person to break this down than 7A from Open Text. Great to see you. Good to see you both as well. Yeah, Excited great, to be here. great job on stage. Thank you. I love the product energy that comes out. I may or may not have been an ex-product guy in a previous <laughs> life. One product guy knows the other. No, no, this is just, I, I love it. It gets down to nuts and, and bolts and making it, it work. So yeah. it was great to see. Oh, yeah. Better when Pat says he used to have a real job. Ah, right. Exactly. That is true. I was I was not even job. talk about the product versus build the product. Exactly. Yeah. And then he has no responsibility. <laughs> it's the best job in the world. I tell you, I want to get that one. <laughs> well, we'll talk after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, so right now, I think there was a big part of kind of this managing content to context. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, AI enables exponential scale. Yeah. But as, to some extent, you know, we got to avoid AI slop. We got to figure out how to get our data ready. We got to, you know, like, what is the challenge in, like, what does this transition look like in yeah. practice? Because this is really, the question really is, yeah, making AI real and valuable right. in the enterprise. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great question. And I'll tell you, I think if you think about what's happened in AI the last two years, it's mainly been you and I going out to a chat GPT or a Claude or something like that and asking a question and trying to get an answer back on that and paying $20, $20 a month as a premium subscription to make that happen. That's what's been mostly the AI usefulness that people have had. And now that needs to get translated into the enterprise, which has so many more controls in place, so much more data. In fact, there's some estimate which says the publicly available data for all the LLMs that have uh, indexed it today is about 10 to 15 zettabytes, yeah. zettabytes or so 1 billion terabytes or so. And uh, inside the enterprise, which is behind the firewall across the board, there's roughly about 150 or so zettabytes. It's so like order 10 times. It's at least yeah. 10 times of that. Now within just our own uh, our own unstructured data stores, which we believe we have one of the largest unstructured data stores in the world, we have about a trillion files. If you had to just lay a flat file across the board, there are about a trillion files across the board that you can use for the right context for the, uh, for the AI applications. And that's what we believe. The right data with the right context is what's going to be needed with the right security for AI and the enterprise to succeed. We printed out a trillion, Pat. We could stack them up and touch the moon or something. There you go. Something like that. Probably, uh, yeah, probably Saturn, but yeah, yeah, I heard what you're saying. So life is all about trade-offs yeah. and so is business and any major transition out there. And, and I'm curious, uh, how are you balancing enterprise readiness for AI yeah. with the security and governance? Because on one hand, the people who do not embrace and activate, activate agentic AI are going to be left behind. Right. And there's exactly. a high likelihood that they will fall behind and maybe even go to business. And we saw this with we saw this with e-commerce. Right. We saw it social local modal. We right. saw even client server transactions. Right. Right. How are you balancing yeah. this triad? Yeah, it's uh, so I was just talking to customers today after some of our announcements. One of them is a major CPG provider out there. We run the entire supply chain for them today. And they're asking the question, okay, how do I make sure that I can get some agents on the platform which can detect any disruptions that are happening in the supply chain so that I can keep that going? Uh, we're going to have another customer, which is an automotive manufacturer. Again, same question. How do I get agents so that they can track everything in the supply chain, do a dual, do a dual source, be able to do a, an anomaly detection, and then be able to keep the supply chain going? Yeah. Those are a combination of all the agents that have to be super secure and that is material impact to these companies. It's not like a nice to have, there's material impact to the company. So 
That's why you needed to have a single platform, which what we say is called does the agent lifecycle management, where you start off creating the agent, but then you also have the right data sources beneath it. But then you also have a way to govern it, to monitor it, to have the right accuracy for it. We introduced a product called Aviator Eval Ops, which is a way for measuring the accuracy of these results. And uh, we are introduced Aviator Studio, which was a platform to build these agents and govern these agents. Yeah. So security and flexibility kind of have to go hand in hand, and they have to be worse very specific use cases like I just mentioned. Makes sense. So another really interesting topic, just to you know, kind of build on this a little bit, and the life cycle thing is actually very interesting. Uh, we need to spend more time on this. I agree. Yeah, okay. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, so we're living in a world, I think I saw, I shared something the other day, Pat, and you talked about eliminating AI slop, and it was like along the lines that now 50% of like the internet content, like articles, blogs, web, yeah. is now AI generated. Right. So very quickly, we went from like, you know, if you look at the the chart, it was yeah. 99.1, and within basically two and a half years. Yeah. We went to 50-50. Now, what that means, and you can take that in context of anywhere AI is being applied, yeah. synthetic data is being grown at a huge right. Right. Because what's happening now is, we're training off of information that was built entirely off AI. So it right. started with something human, right. started creating content right. based on something human, and then every, it's like telephone. Remember the game? Exactly what it is. Exactly it's like, what it is, yeah. So we're going to end up in this place where probably very little of what's actually out there is real. real. Yeah. Most of it is going to be synthetic, because even if people are still contributing, the yeah. scale of AI just keeps getting bigger. Yeah. Population is not growing that much. Right. Um, and then, of course, you've got shared data. Yeah. And so you get all these different data. Like, how do you harmoniously yeah. make these things work? So yeah. let me just let me just kind of qualify that because all of what you just said is totally true in the consumer world. Yes. That's where a lot of this is happening because guess what? Most the those LLM provi uh, providers, the model providers, have ran out of actual data to index. So what do you do next? You create synthetic data. And they are literally doing that right now and providing that as service back to some of the model providers. That's the consumer world. Right. The, but going back to the initial thing, that's about 10 to 15 zettabytes. They're trying to take that 10 to 15 zettabytes and make it 200 zettabytes. I don't really look at that. I look at the 10, 150 zettabytes that's already behind the firewall. How do we tackle that problem? Where there's real data, there's actual real data today and bring that to life. And we have been in the business of, of governing and monitoring our data for our customers and, and be making it compliant for the last 30 years. And guess what we have done with that so far? Nothing. Yeah. That's what's changing. Yeah. And that's what we are doing now. And we're, in, we're bringing life to that data and making it so that it can be ingested with the right knowledge graph, with the right data product. This is really interesting. And, and, and again, you know, um, in a world where, say, for instance, autonomous driving, like yeah. Getting to the ultimate level of safety is really a best opportunity to blend real world data and synthetic, right. right? Or, you know, engineering, designing buildings and bridges, like you can design with a, and then it's going to continue to learn from the best design, right. not a design. So we right. create a lot of synthetic data yeah. in B2B applications. Sure. Yeah. But if I'm hearing you right, what you're basically saying is we're not there yet. You don't even we don't, need to do okay, that. Okay. We don't for, you know, maybe outside of like marketing, some of the functions oh, are accidentally yeah, yeah. facing up, but most ERP data, you know, CRM data, all, most of, customers, customers. all of this data. And the fact that I was having this conversation with somebody and they said, when was cloud introduced? And we were just, it's a rhetorical question. 15 years ago. 15 years ago. It's been 15 years and the whole pr premise of cloud was we're going to have a single repository inside of one st store somewhere that can go and you can be, you can make it compliant. You can make, None of that happened. In fact, if anything, it's become even more cumbersome now because you have so many different data stores on premise, in the cloud, on your NFS, on your NAS, everywhere. So it's even more aggregate, disaggregated. So you got to find a way to first do that aggregation, pre-processing it, and then making it ready for AI. By the way, the, the only caveat I would throw out there uh, would be the physical world, right? You very much have uh, companies that are in manufacturing yeah. and transportation you have to create data that they don't have for 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 autonomy. Yeah. And that's probably the, the one area that they could be. Test data, I can see that. Yeah. Test data for yeah. sure, because then the need to have that as a benchmark, which they have to test with. Yeah, so yeah, that's why driving. My my point was that before even a conversation on synthetic data begins, there is 90% of all the other data we can tackle first. Right. Which can create products which are actually going to be super helpful for our customers right now. Of course, as an analyst, I go to the corner case. Oh, great. Right. So, it's a big case, but I think well, it's yeah. getting a lot of ink. It's getting a lot of sure. discussion sure. Uh, on that. Hey, uh, in a sense, you serve your developers, okay? And developer is a key audience. And uh, 
over the last 25 years, we've seen the fractalization of of apps, right? Uh, API driven, right? And now even for data storage, you have MCP, and now for agents, yeah, right? Yeah. You have agents talking to agents. Yeah. You have super agents, right? How are you modifying, yeah. or are you looking at your strategy, yeah, uh, as you roll out your yeah. products here? Great question. I think it's one of those things where what is the concept of developer now? It used to be that a developer knows how to... Even better question. Yeah. Yes, reframe it. Right. Yeah. So you had a code developer who used to be able to code, and then there was a developer who doesn't need to really code, just understand the API documentation and be able to ingest just the right scripts, depending on whatever you're using, a Node.js, Python, or whatever else, and they're in your application, and boom, you're done. And then there was this no-code movement. <laughs> Where you could yeah. add a bunch of things in a in a really cool graphical UI and be able to connect the dots in a workflow and boom, boom, there you go. That's what became a developer. So what is a developer now? I think a developer actually the concept of the developer is not going to change. The tools they add are going to are going to change. Most people will say, "Well, you don't need to code anymore." I completely disagree. You will absolutely need to code. You will absolutely need to even have something called as a prompt markup language, which is going to come up in the future for sure. There is going to be a defined way to create a markup language for prompts, which makes sense. And you absolutely need to have the integrations. So the concept of developer, I don't think is going to change much. Maybe it becomes a little easier. The, the system knowledge will become much more important. And to change all of that, will you still need to have a developer community? Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. Absolutely. You can't always lean on history, but I mean, when we went from machine code to COBOL, it, we, uh, we didn't need any programmers. We went from COBOL to IDEs. Yeah. We're not going to need any programmers. Right. It's out there. And, you know, same thing for iPhone. Oh. I was going to get rid of photography, and it really democratized people. Well, personal story, most of the developer exactly. at NVIDIA. Exactly. And, and he's very much coding. Yeah. He gets help from Cursor. Right. Or to help him or turn him into a super yeah. uh, developer, but yeah, uh, the the meme, memes are typically not real. They're about the same. In fact, I'm going to date myself, but I, I used to code in VHDL, which was an assembly level language where you could be controlling, con uh, pick controllers to oh monitor a real-time operating system. You look good. <laughs> you look very good. So I go back there yeah. and, I, and I couldn't believe that that's the knowledge because that requires a system's knowledge of how the hardware talks to the software, talks to the application. Yeah is now going to come all the way back right. so that you can use it in today's AI world. Otherwise, you're not going to go far. Yeah, yeah. we've done quite a bit of research on the, the developer, and, and it's just very bifurcated right now. The ones that are doing very well understand the power of AI and are getting exponential productivity. Right. They're right. saying this is the best thing ever. Right, right. Um, there is probably some subset that feels very threatened by it. Right. But like with every major industrial revolution, that's going to, the weed out is is going to be yeah. those that can embrace change yeah, yeah, and yeah. those that can't. 100%. And I think the same thing will happen. So you're the, you know, you're the visionary of product at all things here at Open Text. So let's ask you that future forward mm -hmm. question. Yeah. That what um, what technology do you think are, are going to most influence, you know, this build out? Not specifically, like, what do you think as it relates to AI? Yeah. Like, what's going to be the, you know, biggest influence yeah. of what the future of B2B looks like? Um. Short answer is whatever answer I give you is going to be wrong, uh, but I'll it'll be good for six months. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, I, I love to say that. But but I think for now it's going to be something that most developers who are starting off new, completely new, no knowledge about any, anything else. I'm more interested in how they think versus what they do, because the kind of use cases that they'll be coming up with are things that I would have never imagined myself. Yeah. And that's the kind of knowledge I want as part of the initial kind of what I call the early career talent that's coming into the into the companies. That combined with people who now start to understand the full systems thinking at a very senior level, who already know what tools to use, already know the entire, not just the models. Models, there's two types of people on the developer side. One who are actually creating the models, one who are using the models. That's right. The people who are creating the models are the ones which are the AI researchers and you see all the crazy numbers thrown out for jobs and blah, blah, blah on that. Totally different. But the ones who are using the models, it's not just the models, it's also the rag systems associated with that. It's right. the chunking, it's the embeddings, it's the full AI system. That talent is going to be critical. Yeah, That becomes the new operating system in some ways. And you need to understand how that intersects with all the other existing applications. And that combined with the early career talent, which talks about the new way to use AI, that's a pretty magical combination right Yeah, there. data science students are very much in demand. 
100 might be a little drag on CS these days, but that totally fits into what you're saying. Which, by the way, I don't understand the whole drag on CS because I think that's a myopic approach by most companies yeah. because if you want to really go with people who understand how the systems work, CS is the way to go. Yeah, the, big, the biggest threat, and I know we got to go, but the biggest threat to all of it is in the near term, is always short term breaking the long term. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, AI with doctors will be better. Yeah. But if we don't have a system where a doctor can come in and train, because, yeah. you know, everyone's like, well, the best doctors won't be influenced by AI. But it's like, yeah, but they've had 20 and 30 years of being in the, in the chair right. next to other great doctors. Right. Now you're saying, oh, just use AI. Right. Exactly. And so when do these get trained? When do lawyers get trained? When do engineers get trained? Yeah. So yeah. These are real societal yeah. pressure to kind of figure out how we build talent up. Exactly. So that in 20, 30 years, we have great talent working right. alongside some of the most prolific and capable AI. It has to be that. Right. Way. In the near term, when you're constantly trying to churn quarterly profits, yeah. people are sometimes... Yeah, they get confused by that. In fact, there's a saying out there in the SRE world a long time ago, there was a saying called zero toil, not zero people. Right. Interesting. And that phrase is so relevant right now. It's going for zero toil, right. not zero people. Right. And that, it's not about changing the people. It's it's about augmenting what they're doing. And that I know that gets used a lot, but we believe that. And that's why we have we announced the AI data platform to augment the work that people were doing to make them a lot more productive. Right. Well, Seven, let's uh, continue to have these conversations and hopefully you can augment yourself and get yourself to three, four, five different... Uh, different You're shows. kidding, actually. You're kidding. Let's let's talk next time. Okay. No, I, I'm actually not. I did make a prediction once that there is a CEO of a certain infrastructure chip company yeah. that will probably end up having a bot of himself yeah. to run that company for the rest of eternity. And you may be right. I'll let you know. I'll let you think about who that might be. We won't say it on air. <laughs> Seven, eight, thank you so much for joining us here at the 6.5. Have a great rest of your show. Always great being with you. Thank you. thank you. And thank you so much for being part of the 6.5. We're here on the road in Nashville, Tennessee at Open Text World 2025. Hit subscribe, just for all the coverage here at the event. And, of course, all of our great content here on the 6.5. For this episode, though, we got to say goodbye. See you later.